Cool. Hi, Miguel. Fantastic. Yes, we can see them coming in. Um, hello to everybody. If you are just, you are joining us fast, please say hello, hello in the chat to all of us. Say hello where, where you are um, based and where, um, say your name and where, you're, where you are based at the moment. It'd be lovely to see. Ciao, Alvide. Are definitely coming in thick and fast. So it is two minutes to our designated starting time. Lovely to see you too, Muge. Thank you for saying hello. Um, if you would like to leave a message on the chat, um, please do so. Make sure that the message is set to all pan panelists and attendees. Otherwise, only the panelists will be able to speak to each other. Um, yo, brilliant. Uh, um, please do, yeah, do send to all panelists and attendees, not just to the panelists, because it's lovely for everyone to see each other's um, chat hellos as well. And do let us know where you are joining us from tonight. It would be lovely to know um, as well. Um, our beautiful panel that you see in front of you, waiting excitedly, expectantly for your comments. Hello from Ann Arbor. Hello, Gary Beckman. Hello. Oh, hello from Southern Wales. Fantastic. Um, hello to Marta from Pisa. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Hi, Gul in Istanbul. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. I'm from Mauritius. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, where else have we got? Who else have we got? Oh, we've got quite a few places. I can't keep up. Um, Philadelphia, I've seen Philadelphia, I'm scrolling through. Winchester, hello, Winchester. Hi, Mally. Hi, Philadelphia. That's Philadelphia. What else we got? Ian in Penzance. That must be nice at the moment, it must be warm today. Hi, Kathy in Covidy Durham. <laughs> Hi, Kathy, I hope it's not too bad in Covidy Durham. Um, we've still got some more people coming in. The numbers are still coming, so we'll hold off for another few minutes and let people um, come and join us. Um, hi, Tom in Oxford. Hi, Margaret in Milson, Milton, Massachusetts, and Kamran in London. And Bashak in Idine. Hello. Um, please do let us know where you are. It's lovely. To hi, Selim. Um, okay, we're beginning to slow now and we're reaching our moment. So we'll just give it one or two more minutes for the last few. Oh, there's still, no, still people are still popping in. That's great. Hello, Thomas and Ava Wiswith. Hi, Anna in the New Forest. Hello, everybody. Hey to, hey to all the little ones as well. Um, great to see you all. Fantastic. Um, I guess in the meantime, while we are just waiting, um, I'll just say briefly um, to everyone, hello, it's Nisha, my name's Nisha McSweeney. Um, and uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, you are all on mute. I'm sorry if there's noise of small children in the background, I'll mute myself for quite soon. Um, that you're all on mute and we can't see any of you. You can only, should only be able to see your beautiful uh, pa panel in front of you, who will be talking to you and answering your questions this evening. Um, hello from, from Santiago in Chile. Fantastic. Hi, Danielle. Um, there will be a presentation from Michele for, of about half an hour. Um, then we'll open up to the floor and we'll have discussion. If you have questions, can you please type your questions in the Q&A box? So you'll notice on the bottom of your Zoom control panel. There's the chat box, which hopefully you're all using um, to say hello to us um, in, which is great. Hi to uh, Mario in Lafayette, Colorado. Um, um, but if you've got questions that you would like the panelists to answer, uh, please use the Q&A box, um, because that way we can separate the actual questions from the kind of the more informal discussion, which we're very happy to have going on, on in the chat as well. So feel free to carry on using the chat, but for formal questions, which you'd like the panelists to answer, please do use the Q&A box and we'll be answering those questions 
after the main presentation. Um, I think we, the numbers, there's still people kind of dripping in, but I think we might get going because it is the evening and I'm sure many of you have got important things to be getting on with and certainly our panelists do. Um, so this is a fantastic crowd. Welcome to everybody from uh, at least three continents. Um, I think we've got which is really great to see. It is the third of our Anatolian Studies, the virtual seminar series based on uh, this year's edition. It's a new format that we're trying out and it's been really good fun so far and uh, a good way to dig deeper into some of the articles which you will all I'm sure have read in uh, this year's volume. Uh, today, we're very, very lucky to have a starry panel before us who are going to entertain us with their exciting discoveries and their intellectual um, ad advancements in, in the next hour or the out next hour and 15 minutes or so. And we're going to kick off um, with a presentation from Michaela Massa. Michaela, can you give us a wave? It's Michaela. Hi. <laughs> who's a postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. Once Michaela is given his presentation, we will open up to the wider panel and to discussion. Um, the wider panel before you, you have Christoph Bakuban. Christoph, you want to give a wave? Who is a lecturer in archaeology at St. John's College, Oxford. We have Fatma Shahin, who is... Can, Fatma, can you give us a wave? Hi. Uh, who yeah, is an well. assistant professor in proto-history and Near Eastern archaeology at Chukorova University. Um, we have Hussein Erpelivan, hi Hello. Hussein, who is an assistant professor in classical archaeology at Bilijek University. And last but not least, we have James Osborne. Hello. James, who is assistant professor in Anatolian archaeology at the University of Chicago. Um, I've just seen the last was the last thing in the chat. Greetings to all from Florence. So without further ado, I will hand over um, to Michele um, and I'm going to, rest of us are going to disappear from your screens and we'll just leave you with Michele for the rest of the presentation. All right, so I will try to set the screen. Yeah, I think. Okay. Can you see the, the screen now, the presentation? Yeah. Uh, yes, okay, thanks. All right, so uh, thank you, Nisha, for the wonderful introduction and for inviting us uh, to this um, virtual seminar. Uh, I also want to thank the BIA who is uh, uh, collaborating to make this happen. And thank you all for virtually participating to this. Uh, so as you probably know, the, the Anatolian Studies webinars are, uh, a, uh, centered on the uh, latest articles that appear on uh, the latest volume. Uh, so when, when Nisha asked us to, to, to do a presentation, uh, we were a little bit uh, uncertain how to do it because it was a very big article. So in the end, we decided to focus on a portion of our article, which is more complementary with what uh, James Osborne has presented last month in the same webinar. Um, he presented the uh, new results from the Turkmenkarayuk uh, intensive survey. And what we would like to do today is really contextualizing it uh, within uh, the, 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 the broader uh, Konya plane. Um, so as I, um, as Nisha said, uh, this, is, this is part of um, our ongoing survey project, which is called CRASP. And uh, the main uh, aims of CRAS are to understand the process of urbanization and state formation in a regional context, to understand the human impact of on local environments across uh, long time scales, and understand interaction exchanges through analysis of material culture in the Konya plain. Um, Part of, the, of uh, the, the results we're presenting are also stemming from a sub-project of CRASP, TISP, which is directed by James Osborne, and who is more um, the focus on a single site, which is Turkmen Karayuk, uh, the biggest site in our um, region. And uh, the results of TISP have been presented last month, so I will just very briefly summarize them when necessary. Um, so 
here we are, tonight's panelists. Uh, you can see um, Christoph and I, we are the co-directors of CRASP. Fatma is uh, the assistant director and the pottery, special, the pottery team manager. Uh, James is the director of TISP, of the Turkmen Karuk Intensive Survey. And Hussein is the Cer uh, Iron Age ceramic specialist. And they will all take questions for things I cannot answer, which are many. Uh, so our aims tonight are uh, to provide a synthetic picture of um, the archaeological evidence for the Middle Iron Age based on uh, our um, results from the survey. And this is really geared to try to gauge the geographical extent of the kingdom of Hartapu, which is uh, already known king from the Iron Age and for which we have a new evidence for his uh, rule. And so we'll try to assess uh, what his uh, kingdom might have been uh, based on geographical, archaeological, and philological evidence, and try to discuss what uh, his role might have been within the geopolitical arena of South Central Anatolia in the 8th century BCE. Um, so to set the stage, I think this is a very significant map. Uh, it, and, and our story is sort of set uh, here in South Central Anatolia. You can see uh, this area is bounded by the West and Central Taurus Mountains in the South and by the Bose Mountains in the Northwest. And uh, the whole Greater Konya Basin uh, is an endorheic basin. So it means that all the rivers that flow into it do not have an outlet to the sea and they create um, sort of uh, river deltas uh, and water goes um, out through evaporation or uh, goes into the, into the groundwater table. Uh, this creates uh, several deltas, which you can see here in green. And why is this important? It's because this is the driest area in uh, modern Turkey. Uh, it is uh, barely above, in many areas, it's barely above the uh, limit for uh, um, rain-fed agriculture. And uh, today, without modern irrigation systems, most of the area would be steppe. And it was also in the Iron Age, as we know from several uh, palynological proxies. Uh, so really, these um, alluvial basins were uh, where most of the agricultural production would have taken place in the Iron Age. And uh, you can see they are marked today uh, by all of the major towns in the area, which, uh, yes, all of the major towns in the area. And the, the two major basins are on the left, uh, the Charshamba River Delta, and on the northeast, the Melendis River and uh, around Aksaray. And uh, all, all of these basins were actually the center of major bronze and iron age centers, as you can see here. Uh, the steppe would have been, of course, exploited economically, uh, for example, um, uh, through animal husbandry or hunting, but really played a very marginal role uh, in sedentary settlements. So we will show a little bit later for the area that we are focusing on, which is the Konya Plain here, we have no evidence for sediment uh, mounded settlements in the steppe really before the Achaemeni period. Uh, and this is important because I think that uh, already now we can see how the steppe may have uh, somehow divided uh, or uh, become buffer zones for Iron Age polities. So um, the, 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 the study area of crust is really the Konya and Karaman plains here. And uh, before entering into the fray, we would like to uh, talk a little bit about Hartapu. What do we know about Hartapu? Uh, we know that he was a ruler active in, in, uh, in the Konya region, which I just show. And uh, he is known from uh, now eight inscriptions. Uh, or, uh, many of which celebrate his military victories, and they celebrate the construction of two uh, sites. One is Kuzulda and one is Karada. They are two uh, peak sites 
and uh, we're not going to talk about uh, a lot about it, but we are working on the hypothesis that might be peak sanctuaries in the sort of tradition of uh, Hittite sanctuaries. And uh, uh, there are several inscriptions, both of Hartabu, both at Kuzulda and Karada. Unfortunately, Hartabu is not mentioned in other contemporary sources, either from Tabal, Assyria, or Hittites. And this has led, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, it is not really clear until we think uh, our uh, recent discovery, it was not very clear when Hart Hartapu did reign. So there are several uh, hypotheses. Um, so one is that he might have been uh, a king of, of the Taruntasha kingdom in the late uh, Hittite empire, or he might have been uh, an Iron Age king, or uh, there might have been two Hartapus, uh, sons of Murshili, uh, that have lived four centuries apart, and the later Hartapu uh, would have sort of uh, uh, built upon the earlier Hartapu. And this is uh, this is uh, an ongoing debate, and uh, I think that David Hawkins and Mark Whedon uh, would uh, disagree with our views that we will present in a second. Um, and uh, David Dawkins for, for a long time uh, suggested that uh, Artapu would have been uh, a late uh, Hittite, uh, a king associated with the late Hittite uh, empire. And these are shaped in a sense what we knew about Artapu. Um, so these are the uh, no, already known inscriptions. And uh, they're all relatively brief. And uh, they are saying that they are quite repetitive in many ways. And um, what is important for the following discussion is that Hartapu claims uh, has the self-appointed title of great king, which he uses uh, quite frequently. He also defines himself as the son of Mursili. Mursili. And in uh, several inscriptions, he mentions uh, his military victories. Um, in particular, in Kuzulda IV, he mentions conquering the country of, uh, and, and that sign uh, for the country of is really uh, not well preserved. And Hawkins has suggested uh, it, it would, uh, that it could be completed as Massa because there was a, a non late Bronze Age uh, polity. Uh, but our new uh, finding suggests that it might be something different. And uh, so this is the, the Dune inscription that was found uh, uh, by the Turkmen Karayuk intensive project. And it was found at Turkmen Karayuk. And uh, it has been analyzed by Petra Röde Rebure and Theo van de Hoot, and it was already published. Uh, it will also be uh, the uh, focus of uh, another Anatolian study seminar, so I will uh, keep my comments to a bare minimum. What it does provide is a lot more detail about uh, the military campaigns of Hartapu. So he, he mentions conquering the country of Mushka, which is likely to be Phrygia in Northern Anatolia. And he also mentions uh, to have uh, fought against a coalition of 13 kings, which he doesn't uh, name. And again, we will see later, they might be uh, people that, um, rulers to the east of uh, the Konya Plain. Why Turkmen Karuk 1 is so important is because it is uh, filling um, uh, a gap. In, in what we knew about Hartabu. So uh, Petra and Theo's detailed uh, stylistic analysis clearly uh, indicates that uh, it can be dated to the eighth century. Uh, and in fact, they suggest, and uh, we tend to agree that all of Hartabu's inscription are contemporary because they all mention a great king, a hero, son of Mushili, conquering, uh, a lot of places, and it, it sounds uh, logical that they, they would belong uh, to the same king, and we are open to discussion at the end of, of, of the talk about this. Um, what 
Hartapu claims, and this is not necessarily true, but he also claims to have been a successful war leader, um, which is something that we, go, uh, we will come back to. And lastly, the location itself or where the inscription was found is perhaps suggesting that the place would have been, could have been Hartapu's capital. Uh, so Turkmen Karayuk, as I said, was already, uh, has already been published uh, the, at this 2019 season. What, they, what we found, the, the main results is, are that there is during the late bronze and the early to mid uh, iron age, uh, the site is very, very big. Uh, the mound itself is fully occupied and is 30 hectares. And the lower settlement, according to however we want to count, uh, however we want to, to, to define the, the area covered by uh, diagnostic shirt is between 70 and 100 hectares. Now, this year we couldn't really go back to the field because of coronavirus. We were planning to uh, complete the intensive survey and to do some geophysics that would have given us a better idea of the extent we will hope to do it next year. But what even this preliminary result suggests is that Turkmen Karyuk was very, very big uh, for the standards of uh, Central Anatolia and neighboring regions. And this is, uh, you know, a sort of visual uh, show of this. So these are uh, a lot of major centers, uh, contemporary with, uh, broadly contemporary with Turkmen Karyuk, for which, uh, intensive survey of the lower town has been conducted. And what you can see here, uh, without any doubt, is Turkmen Karyuk ranks among the largest uh, of its peers, both in terms of mound size alone and uh, the size of the lower town. Of course, with all the caveats uh, that we already explained, I mean, we are still in the process of concluding this intensive survey, but it shows at least it was a very important center. Now, what is around um, Turkmen Karim? So you can see here, uh, what our sur uh, survey area, cross survey area, uh, with all the sites that we already found, and uh, in black are sites that were already published. So we have been trying to combine uh, both data sets together and we will show in a second uh, what, what are the main uh, dynamics uh, that are active in the region. Before doing so, we just want to have some disclaimers uh, in the sense that we have some problems as all surveys have, but in particular, we have problems in dating early and middle Iron Age, distinguishing them. Uh, because there are no other excavated sites we can compare with, because uh, this is, uh, typical of uh, Central Anatolian Iron Age pottery has very little variation, is very repetitive and uh, uh, continue, many forms continue across uh, different subphases. And before you ask, no, we do not have dark phase handmade early Iron Age wares as in the north. Also, and this is something that already Mellert in the 50s noticed, uh, the really the, the Iron Age colonial plane wear repertoire is very plain. So we have very little decorated wares, which is one of the reasons why uh, we cannot really compare with other areas because most of the diagnostics in other areas, published diagnostics at least, are painted or decorated in some form. Uh, so yes, especially for smaller sites with and that have uh, uh, coarser wares or for smaller ceramic assemblages, we have difficulties to uh, finally date uh, the periods of occupation. This notwithstanding, we think that it is good still to, to, to try attempting uh, to, to provide a, a broad picture of, of, of the region of what happens in the region. And this is what we know are the known Iron Age sites in the region. Uh, in red are the major centers and what we see is that major centers like Sirchala, for example, uh, reach up to 40, 45 hectares, which are bigger than some of the Northern Levantines uh, capital cities, for instance. Uh, but most of the other sites are actually relatively small, uh, which is different from what we had in previous periods where we had a, a multi-tiered uh, sort of uh, uh, structure. Uh, 
satellite size tend to be very, very small, uh, which, which accounts probably for a higher degree of centralization. And what I was mentioning before, you can see here, there are no mounted sites in the step, and this is a very strong pattern because uh, we have a total of over 450 sites uh, known uh, for this area. Um, what we also realize is that there is a large number of fortified sites uh, in the highlands, uh, most of which are multi-period, not necessarily continuously occupied, but occupied several in, during several phases, some at least from the third millennium BC, and this is what you see during the early to mid Iron Age. They clearly seem to go surround the Konya Plain uh, in some format. They all, without exclusion, are associated with uh, major modern uh, roads. So they seem to have had a control over movement in and out of the Konya Plain. And we will come back to this slide a little bit later. Uh, what I want to stress is that other similar networks of fortified hilltops do exist in Bronze Age Anatolia. So this is not an isolated case. And other people have made a similar case that this could be coordinated systems that might to some extent um, hint at a territorial control in this period. Uh, for uh, ceramic aficionados, we have put some uh, slides on what are the major uh, imported wares that uh, may suggest uh, interaction at a super regional scale. The most common of all the uh, imported wares is the gray ware, uh, which has very likely northern connections with uh, the Phrygian highlands. Um, and outside of our area to the north and to the west in the, in the Beishe area, for example, in the Ulgan area, uh, gray ware are more common. And here uh, you can see on the left, uh, this is Turkmen Kavik has a lot, a lot more than other sites, but gray wares sporadically appear at smaller sites as well. What does not appear at smaller sites is what is a label, Alishar for style wear. I mean, not necessarily, of course, coming from Alishar or from that area necessarily, but just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, these are very rare in our region. And so far, we have only found them in Turkmen Karayuk, and you see examples here, and a single shirt from Jijek. So they're essentially a very uh, rare uh, import. Phrygians were, on the other hand, are a little bit more common, and they are also found at other major centers in the region, uh, especially one peculiar variety uh, is very glossy, very so, so has a soapy feeling like this one, this one, this one, this one as well, and they have very close parallel with Gordian. Uh, so at present, we are of the idea that this might be a uh, direct import from the Phrygian uh, core area. Uh, what all of this uh, evidence shows is that uh, while there is some uh, import in the in the surrounding region, Turkmen Karyuk is really the hub uh, for imported wares, which uh, sort of highlights its importance in the super regional network. Um, other um, hints for uh, interaction with certain regions is, for instance, given by defensive architecture. So this on the left is uh, the plan of Sechmekale uh, in the west of the Konya Plain. And here you see Chevrekale's uh, um, uh, satellite imagery. Uh, and this is uh, in Yarashle, in Kulu, uh, in, in the sort of uh, southwest of uh, Ankara. And uh, Jeffrey Summers uh, already suggested in the 90s that this could be, uh, th th this is without having necessarily precise parallel, but this is a, a, a genre of Phrygian fortification that will also be seen later at Kerkenes. Uh, and uh, there are also a number of step monuments, the most uh, famous of which is Kuzelda here, but there are others which I didn't put. 
and that are less well uh, published. And they all broadly fit with uh, what are mostly uh, uh, known from Frigi uh, Phrygian islands, the, the, the sort of steppe monument. It doesn't necessarily mean that there was a Phrygian presence uh, in sort of Phrygian kingdom rule, but it, it sort of suggests uh, interactions between uh, these areas. And uh, a totally on an opposite direction, both the Kuzilda uh, relief of Hartapu and uh, the Ivris relief of Warpalawa, they clearly have uh, Neo-Assyrian influences. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why later we will, we will suggest that Hartapu may be dated later in the 8th century. And they have very close parallel with uh, Sennacherib uh, um, reliefs uh, um, in Mesopotamia and the Levant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so now moving forward to uh, trying to define what might have been the boundary of Hartapu's kingdom, I will want to uh, give some uh, caveats um, as well here. Um, and uh, there are there, there is some evidence that uh, the, 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 the concept of border uh, was known to uh, Iron Age people was uh, already, the concept first appears in Hittite text and particularly the Tarantasha treatise uh, give a lot of detail about uh, uh, borders, and they often and the treaties often use geographical feature to describe boundaries between Tarantasha and Patti. Uh, this is also very uh, clear in other in hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions, where border, borderlands, border forts are mentioned, and where, uh, for example, in Topada a river is marked as a boundary between two polities. So they did know what a border was and they were using it uh, to describe their polity against another one. This notwithstanding, we know from uh, different sources that uh, boundaries of different polities in Tabal especially were ver very volatile. Uh, different years, they have totally different geopolitical configurations. So we shouldn't necessarily think of borders in this, especially in this period as uh, stable and solid and established. And this is also because uh, alliances and uh, treaties of vassalage also change very quickly. Um, and uh, we should also not trust uh, source, textual sources, especially if they only come from one single side, uh, because they could be simply propaganda. And also what is very clear from uh, Sargon annals uh, and, and, and the movement of uh, Tabellian rulers is that a lot of uh, military campaigning uh, would have had the aim to loot and or renegotiate uh, the political standing rather than uh, having a territorial expansion, which is something that we need to take into consideration when trying to define uh, Hartapu's kingdom's extent and the relative extent of other kingdoms around. This notwithstanding, um, I think that because specifically because it was mentioned in text, and this is there is a good match with archaeological evidence. Uh, the numerous forts that are surround the Konya Plain might hint at what uh, sort of the core of Hartapu's kingdom might have looked like. So the Konya Plain with this uh, rich uh, agricultural land could have been uh, Hartapu's, you know, this is just speculation, but could have been uh, part of Hartapu's kingdom more stably. Uh, we are not suggesting at all that uh, there have been hard boundaries like uh, uh, in Roman times. Uh, in, in, if anything, I mean, this force would have just been controlling pinch points uh, in, the, in the landscape. And they could have been uh, uh, conquered by different polities at different times. But this is just an impressionistic um, uh, picture, let's say. Uh, also important to, to discuss is when did Hartapu rule? So I uh, already mentioned that Petra and Theo's uh, work 
indicates very strong similarities between Turkmen Karayuk and Topala Suvasa and Gossesin inscriptions, which are generally uh, almost unanimously dated to the 8th century BC. Um, there are two options. One is that he might have ruled earlier in the 8th century, and this would explain why there is no mention of him in, in the Assyrian sources. Or, and this is our favorite, uh, uh, favored uh, hypothesis, he might have ruled around the mid uh, 8th century BCE, not only because Kuzundar Elif is clearly influenced by uh, Assyrian templates, uh, but also because uh, there are some hints that uh, uh, Hartat, who may have been uh, contemporary with Wasusarma and Warpalawas, and I will show them in a second. So this is uh, the, the region between Tabal, which is uh, somewhere be, uh, here, uh, Mushka, which is approximately here. And this is what we suggest based on the archeological evidence that it might have been Hartabus kingdom. Now, and this is, we are entering into the realm of speculation, um, but you know, just, just very, very broadly, looking at the extent of Wasusarma's uh, inscription, the maximum range of action, let's say, that Wasusarma seems to have had is uh, between Obaoran and Kululu, a sort of Cappadocia, uh, in Cappadocia. Um, on the other hand, Warpalawas, uh, both through his inscription and through the, the location of Goluda, which was a peak century possibly, probably, associated with Tuwana. Uh, so he would fit in sort of the Southern Cappadocia um, uh, corner. And uh, probably before Midas, uh, the, the Mushka was a loser confederation of uh, local uh, kingdoms. And, uh, you know, again, this is pure guesswork, but it might have not extended further than, uh, than the Salt Lake. So when Turkmen Karuk uh, one inscription mentions uh, that Hartup conquered Frigia, we don't necessarily need to think that uh, he conquered the whole of Frigia or Gordian itself, but it might have skir skirmished or raided uh, the area between Ulgan and Kulu, Jihanbeli, like sort of the, the border area of, of Mushka. And it might not have been even a, a stable conquest. For, for all we know. What is interesting is that in the same inscription, uh, Hartapu mentions uh, 13 kings, uh, which uh, fit quite nicely in terms of number with what we know from Topada and other inscriptions are approximately the number of small and smaller and greater kings of uh, Tabal. So this is again speculation, but we suggest that the 13 kings in Turkmenkarik inscription may have been the Tabelian kings. And this, in a sense, fits well with uh, the evidence in Burunkaya, which is on the left bank of the Melendis River here, which doesn't mention kings or anything, but mentions the fact that he did defeat an enemy there. And uh, the location strongly suggests that this enemy may have been a king or multiple kings uh, between Tuwana and Bitburutas, I mean, Tab Tabelian kings. There is no direct evidence for it, but it fits with the sort of reconstruction that we have made so far. So Hartapu would have, in a military campaign, uh, arrived all the way to the Melendis River, would have planted a flag there, and come back. And we are not suggesting again that this would have been a sort of stable control of Hartapu. Um, of course, the location of Burunkaya, the fact that it's on a major river, the fact that uh, Topada mentions uh, Wasusarma crossing a river to go into the enemy's territory, uh, it's, it's, it's too good a, of a, an opportunity not to, to at least mention it. Um, again, there is not much evidence for it, but it is totally possible in our opinion that Hartapu might have been the Parzutean king mentioned in the Topada inscription. So to wrap things up, 
what was the rule of Hartapu within the context of 8th century South Central Anatolia? Uh, there is very little doubt that he would have been an important king. king. So even if it is a self-assigned uh, uh, title, the, the, the title of great king suggests that he had uh, he was higher in standing than most of local kings that are also mentioned in local sources, in Assyrian sources. And while Tuwati and Wasusarma also have the title of great kings, it is important to, to, to notice that the Tuwana dynasty didn't. So having the, the title of great king is possibly a sign of high standing within the region. And his capital is, of course, a very big uh, site. Uh, which controlled the most fertile and the largest agricultural basin in the region. Hartapu uh, wrote at least eight inscriptions in, different, in four different spots, and uh, he also sponsored, possibly sponsored the construction of Khuzelda and Karada pig sanctuaries, or at least their uh, renovation, let's put it this way. According to him and only him, he was at some point able to wage war against Phrygia and Tabal, which in itself, uh, if true, would have been uh, uh, quite a, a feat uh, for, uh, for a local king in, in the region. Um, and this is something we didn't discuss at all here, but it is in our article on Anatolian studies. Uh, the, the, the region where Hartapu's supposed uh, kingdom uh, lies was originally the area of Tarantasha. Tarantasha was probably bigger than, than, than Hartapu's kingdom, but uh, there is actually quite some evidence archaeologically for continuity between the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age in this area. There is no evidence for collapse. There is actually evidence, at least at Turmankari, for the continuation of uh, urban uh, tradition. And uh, Hartapu himself. Um, calls himself great king, uh, builds pig sanctuaries. There, there is possibly some uh, uh, reminder that he, he may have indirectly come from uh, that legacy. So overall, uh, Hartapu was a very important figure in a central Anatolia, and uh, it needs to be recognized uh, a little bit more uh, in the future, and we think that uh, our work is contributing to this. So to conclude, of course, this is all very preliminary, all very speculative in many ways. Uh, we hope that uh, the Turkmen Karek Intensive Surveys 2021 season will be able to sort of refine what the size of Turkmen Karek will be. And of course, excavation will be good to, uh, to give us some more data about Hartapu and his uh, contemporaries. And uh, we would like to thank you all for listening and TISP and CRASS teams for, uh, for all the effort and all the passion that they put. And uh, we would also like to thank Selim Adala for uh, all things uh, related to Assyrian sources. All mistakes are of course our own. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michaela. Hello. Um, let's see if we can bring back the rest of our panel and maybe bring us back um, visually as well. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. There's so much to discuss here. There has been one question that has already come in. Um, I think there'll be many more questions that come in along the way. So I'll, I'll wait for one minute. I shall, um, I shall read out the question that came in very early so that we can start addressing that. Um, and then I'll start asking us, if I get the chance, I'll ask some questions of my own. So the first question that came in quite close into the beginning of the call comes from Jeffrey Edgson, who says, on the panel with Turkmen Karahuyuk 1, have you recognized the type of script used in the inscription? I'm no expert, but the script appears to be similar to Mycenae Millennium B, yet Lewin hieroglyphs would geographically be more likely. Um, would anyone like to address? Yeah, sure. It is a hier hieroglyphic Lewin. There is no doubt about it. 
Fantastic. Uh, the next question has come in from how Pedro Hallett Cravinho, sorry. Um, he tells us the seminar has been a pleasure to audit. He um, is interested in uh, the archaeology of the Troad um, and he wonders if any of your findings make reference to Wailusha Tarusa or any of the personages or place names of the Iliad. No. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if anybody is interested in these wider questions, do feel free to talk. Uh, email the uh, presenters offline. Um, I had Anisha, a question. just to give a, a, a small, a little uh, longer uh, answer to that. We don't have any archaeological or textual evidence that there is any interaction uh, between the Konya region and the Aegean in this point in time which actually fits a little bit with the question that I've been wanting to ask. Um, and I'm glad I've just got in before the next question has come in in the Q&A box. Um, this is, I'm not getting there, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of the historical side to talk about, but I'll leave that to other people, other attendees who are better qualified. I wanted to ask a little bit about the survey archeology, span I'm afraid. Um, mm -hmm. Your fortifications, so many of them look like they are ringing the North. There doesn't look like there's there's much going on down south, and I wondered whether you would like anybody, any of you, would like to speculate on what this means for relationships between the Konya Plain and uh, the place which is dearest to my heart, which is the River Valley. <laughs> All right. Um, first, that is the picture for the Iron Age, uh, and certainly there seems not to be a lot of Iron Age forts. Uh, in the Karaman area for this period. They, they, were, they were in the Bronze Ages, several, several of them. Um, why is that? I have no clue whatsoever. I mean, uh, I don't think it's very likely that uh, the Goksu Valley would have been part of Hartapus kingdom. I mean, the, 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 the size of uh, the other kingdoms like tu Tuana and Bitburutus, they sort of suggest what could have been, you know, uh, a, a average size for large uh, polities in the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, adding that the Goxu Valley would have been very, very going well beyond what that, that size is. Fantastic. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we've got more questions coming. Doug Baird says, nice stuff. Where do you think Alat and Tepe fits in with your understanding of developments in the Konya Plain in the Iron Age? All right. So uh, I actually, uh, we showed some Phrygian ware uh, painted pottery from Alat and Tepe, which, as everybody knows, I mean, is a very uh, badly excavated, very badly published uh, site. Uh, within current Konya. So it was uh, very, very likely a big, big center in the Middle Iron Age, uh, subordinated to Turkmen Karayuk, we think. We cannot uh, say what is the, the current, what the original size of the lower settlement because it's under the ur urban layout of Konya. Uh, but given the very little we know, it suggests that it might've been a secondary center of the polity. This is our suggestion, or at you know a vassal a polity of Artapu. Okay, Hypothesis, I'm just speculation. In. I'm just going to jump in on that. Um, I mean, if if we want to equate um, Konya with Ikuania in the late Bronze Age, uh, which again, um, you know, I think is, is not there isn't a lot of on the ground or hard evidence for it, but during the late Bronze Age. If we want to believe that Ikuanya is Konya, then those were two separate polities, Tarantasha, Ikuanya, right? So, um, you know, and there's nothing saying that Aladdin Tepe couldn't also be potentially similarly independent in the Iron Age. I get, you know, this is wild speculation. But again, if we want to think that Ikuanya is Konya, then here we have two polities, Tarantasha and Ikuanya, in the late Bronze Age. So, just throwing it out there. <laughs> right, if we can move to the, the next question. Orhan F. Yavuz says, thank you for the presentation. Can we be certain Hartapu's reign preceded that of Midas or his father if he's the person buried in Tumulus MM? 
it must also be before the monumental tumuli culture spread across Anatolia. Is that right? Um, I mean, this is very difficult to answer this, I think. Um, definitely, there, there are no tumuli uh, datable to the Middle Iron Age in the Konya Plain, that, that I can tell. There is a, a small tumulus uh, in Turkmen Karayuk, and that is uh, Hellenistic, I think, we think. Uh, so that is that part answered. Uh, could it be contemporary with Midas or one of the <clears throat> Midas dynasty? It could have, definitely could have. I mean, we don't have a, a very precise date for Hartabu because there is no Assyrian source that mentions him so far. And uh, if he is uh, the Parzutian king, which is not sure at all, then he would be contemporary with Sasagma. But if he isn't, uh, then it could be contemporary with either Midas, which is a little bit later, or Midas ancestors, which were certainly quite powerful even in the 9th and 10th centuries BCE. So it could be. We have no idea. More, more, more unknowns. Uh, Kathy Draycott says, any evidence for 7th or 6th century BCE or Achaemenid occupation or lack thereof? Who's saying? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can say that there is a continuity for after the Middle Iron Age. I prepared some examples for you, but I think Michele cut my plates. Uh, <laughs> what can you say, Sorry. Michele? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you, do you want to answer that the question about the Achaemenid occupation of Turkmen curry, for example? Well, we have a lot of evidence from the Achaemenid period. We we haven't put any visuals to this presentation because it's not the main topic of this presentation. But we have strong evidence and a strong layer at the top of the mound, which is mostly late Iron Age, we can call it. Firstly, Lydian, then the Achaemenid, then after the Hellenistic layer. So uh, to complement this, uh, I think that um, Turkmen Karayuk um, becomes smaller during the Achaemenid period, the, the, the late Iron Age, let's put it this way. During the late Iron Age, it becomes something like uh, 60, 70 hectares, I think, James, would you say so? Yeah, maybe even smaller than that, maybe even more smaller. like 50, something like this. Yeah. So it shrinks in size, and definitely there is... Uh, it, it loses importance after the Middle Iron Age. That is for sure. Uh, what we seem to think uh, for the regional patterns is that all the steppe that were completely barren from the Neolithic to the Middle Iron Age, there is a population of these areas that we currently date to the late Iron Age. So there is a number of like 20, 25 sites that appear in the steppe in, in contemporary, in archaeological terms at least. And we suggest they may be the sign of a more centralized Achaemenid uh, exploitation of the landscape. So with irrigation systems, and this is also supported by evidence at Kanukoyu. Uh, in the 6th century in Konukoyuk, in Cappadocia, there is an intensification of agricultural production and it might be connected with the sort of same horizon. That's it. Well, we have a, a few more. Um, I think just on that, Kathy Draycott's following up with saying, uh, so we're talking about people moving into the steppe land, centralized or pastoral estates. You mean centralized as an empire, not science, presumably? Um, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, these are, of course, the same people that were living in the Delta, their offsprings, a part of their communities are resettled. I mean, there is no change in material culture that we can detect at the moment. So we're not thinking, you know, Persian relocation from other sides of the empire. They seem to be pretty local. 
uh, it seems to be pretty sudden. And, uh, you know, why I say centralized is because irrigation needs a lot of uh, sponsoring, state-sponsored state uh, man, uh, manpower, a lot of maintenance, a lot of bureaucracy around it, uh, which seems better fit for an empire rather than a small territorial polity of the Middle Iron Age. That is uh, why we think it might be more closely associated with an imperial occupation, imperial present, let's put it this way. Does it answer? Possibly. So it, 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 you're dating these, um, these irrigation works on, on that logic basis rather than... Um, no, we're not dating irrigation works. We're right. dating the, the founding of these settlements to the late Iron Age. And I think uh, Hussein can uh, talk about this. We're not, there is no direct evidence for irrigation at any point in any time before the, the let's say, Ottoman period, right? But we think and talk about the, the, the dating of the settlements, maybe. The steppe settlements are begin. They are beginning to settle during the fifth, especially fourth century BC, and also there is a direct continuity after the late Iron Age to the Hellenistic and Roman period. Uh, I can say that, yeah. So we have we have a few more questions. Anna Lucia Dagata asks, what about connections with Cilicia in the 8th century BC? Do you see any signs of contact? I cut another of Hussein's slide. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we can also say that there, are, there can be a connection between the Cilicia and our region in terms of the Middle Iron Age and also the late Iron Age, that we have some black and red wares, which is not seen in this slide, that can be influenced from the Cilicia and Cilician polychrome wear that we have some shirts. And some of this is uh, discussed in the uh, Turkmen Karakuy Anatolian Studies article as well, if people want to follow up with it. Mm -hmm. Hello, Gia says, thank you for cutting the Cilician slide. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question from Anna Collar, or, or a couple of questions. She says, "Are you is she right in thinking that there were no Iron Age mounded sites in the steppes? Does that change at a later date? And if so, does this uh, can this be linked to changes in climate or agriculture, which makes these areas a bit more settleable? And how far did you get up into the mountains? She wants to know. That's a question. All right. Um, well. Uh, we did uh, our uh, trekking in the mountains in the first couple of years. And, uh, and there is another uh, survey also that focuses only on the Bosda, which are the Bosda mountains, which are on the northern side of the, the Konya plain. And uh, we haven't found anything substantial, which doesn't mean that they didn't live there. It doesn't mean they didn't exploit the, the resources that existed there. Certainly, there was a lot of hunting. Certainly, the, uh, certainly, very likely there was a lot of hunting. There was a lot of uh, quarrying. There is a lot of uh, you know using the hilltop sites, which are in the highlands. Uh, we have not found, and not only we, but also Asam Bahar, who extensively uh, surveyed the Taurus Mountains, which is which are outside of our survey area. He did not find very significant evidence for Hoyuk. I'm not saying that there might have been other forms of uh, less, uh, more ephemeral settlement. They didn't use, they didn't create Hoyuks. So uh, I'm sure that, that there were people living there. It's just the density of population was uh, infinitely lower than in the, in the, in the agricultural basins and alluvial deltas. Jizem uh, Gune asked, what can be said of the Hellenistic findings? I stop here, you saying because we are not allowed to talk about the Hellenistic findings. I mean, our survey permit goes all the way to the end of the Iron Age. So there are plenty, but we cannot discuss them.
It has a high potential. We can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that cool. If anybody interested to survey coin and plane, please come. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Sue Sherratt says, you seem to suggest that the fortifications could be compared with Phrygian ones. Can you please say more about this? Is there any relationship with late Bronze Age fortifications? Okay. So, uh, so we have two types of uh, evidence. One is uh, sites that are on a hilltop and there is just pottery scatters. Um, and there are sites that are on a hilltop, there are pottery scatters, and there are fortifications which are generally never dated earlier than the Iron Age, uh, based on very broad uh, speculations about architecture, right? I mean, we are not saying anything certain here, but there are no, there is no direct evidence for Bronze Age circuit walls. There is evidence for a lot of Bronze Age sites on a barren, in a barren landscape, otherwise not conducive to any agriculture, very exposed to winds, uh, without water, and uh, with no evidence for ritual, uh, for a ritual function of it. I mean, I'm not saying that they, might, they, they, they did not have a ritual function, is that we didn't see any evidence for it. So for us, the best option remains fortification. And there is a lot of sites that are fortified in the Iron Age and also have a lot of Bronze Age occupation, which reinforces our idea that these were fortified hilltops. And there is a lot of continuity in many of these, not all, but many. In the what we think, the late Iron Age, there is a diversification of uh, functions probably in, in these forts. Some of them are very big. Some have uh, large garrisons around it. Some are very small. So they might have been integrated in a more complex system of uh, regional uh, protection, fortification, let's say. But this is, again, speculation. But there is continuity between a lot of these sites, between the early, even early Bronze Age and the late Iron Age. For instance, Kuzilda. Kuzilda is one of those. And uh, we are also uh, working with Asam Bahar to publish his uh, materials of, of, from all of these forts. And Kuzilda has a continuous occupation from the mid-third millennium to basically medieval period. Just to play a little bit of devil's advocate on these forts. Please. So, I, so I, I'm no Romanist, but I understand that the way that um, people are trying to make sense of the Roman limes is more that things like Hadrian's Wall and these forts are actually fo fo places to focus interaction and places to, which bring people together. They're foci rather than divisions. And would that change your interpretation if, if limes are not hard borders either? No, no, no. But they are, they are, I mean, the, Lime, the Roman limits on the Euphrates is a much harder border than the Hadrian Wall, in my opinion. Uh, because there is, the, I mean, there is the Euphrates, which is in itself uh, a barrier to interaction. But anyway, uh, I think um, the Roman limits was mostly not on mountains, right? It was in a plain. So it was easier to, 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 make it a focus of interaction. But these are actually quite isolated on the mountains. I mean, it, it took us quite a lot of sweat to go to some of these. So I would strongly doubt there were places for market fairs or anything else. Fair enough. I've missed a comment in the chat, I'm afraid, because I was monitoring the Q&A. Mark Whedon says, thanks for the presentation. You're doing really great work. But you cannot agree with the dating of Kizildar 4 to the 8th century, which sure. means throwing out all of our dating criteria out of the window. Kizildar 1 plus relief, 8th century, yes. Mushka equals Phrygians, no. Would anybody like to comment on that? Can I just ask you, Mark, if you mean Mushka equals Phrygians, no, also in the Turkmen Karahuya conscription or simply in Kuzilda 4? Both, okay. Both. 
I mean, I am certainly no expert of the Iron Age or of uh, hieroglyphic Luvian. Uh, I will try to answer and then I will probably let James uh, comment on my comments or maybe James, you want to talk first? Please. Uh, I, not really. I mean, these are questions really for the philologists. I think it's probably best answered by Petra Hildekoboda and Theo Mendenhout. Um, but in the meantime, I think if one is willing to date, let's say, Turkmenkar Huyukwan to the 8th century, then the mushka that it refers to would very plausibly be associated with Phrygia, which is what the Neo-Syrian texts use at that time to refer to that kingdom of Maitas. Um, so maybe, I, I guess I would ask on what grounds you would think the 8th century mushka from Turkmenkar Huyukwan is not, in fact, Phrygia. And Miguel, yes. maybe. Yeah, and on this, I mean, yes, there, there are mushki that are also uh, coming into contact with Assyrians in the middle uh, Assyrian period, I think, and they're in the region around uh, uh, the Antitoros, so, you know, several hundred kilometers away from Hartapu. And I think that uh, for what we know of the geopolitical uh, configuration, oh, hi, Mark, uh, geopolitical configuration of Tabal, Hartapu would have needed to bulldoze all of these smaller kings before getting to Mushka, the, the Mushka you are meaning, I think. So I, I, I would exclude uh, those Mushka from the conversation, in my, in my opinion, in terms of Kuzil Dafur being a uh, 12th century. Again, I'm no linguist, but simply logically, we have eight inscriptions of which at least five are well dated into the 8th century. They all mention a great king, Hartapu, son of Mursili, who conquered land. Uh, Kuzilda IV has uh, conquered the country of Ma or Mu, I don't remember, but, and then there is a sign that cannot be read. So again, it's, it, it strongly points into that direction. Why would two kings, Hartapu, son of Mursili, have existed 400 years apart goes beyond my imagination. And why the second Hartapu would have flattened his own image to the earlier Hartapu. So he didn't try at all to distinguish himself and his gesture and his uh, role from the earlier one. To me, it doesn't make any sense from simply a logical argumentation. I've just allowed Mark to speak in case he does want to respond. It sounded like this was a discussion which might be easier done if Mark could speak. Mark, can you speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's not go into it too much, um, you know, but uh, it, I just cannot see Kizildar for being 8th century BC because it is 12th century BC or early empire period. And, uh, you know, if I wanted to list all the particular details, all its correspondences are with um, inscriptions from that period. Uh, and I'm afraid I just don't agree with the dating that uh, Petra and Teo have come up with. Um, the mention of the Muska, yes, you're quite right. You have all these in the 12th century over in the Turabdin area and um, or indeed yes we're very early in the 12th century and they're not attached to anywhere they seem to be mobile population uh, and I would say it's these Muska that are being referred to both in Turkman Karahuyuk and in Kuzil Darfur um, mobile populations that are moving through the area uh, of course that's extremely speculative but I would the first line of Turkman Karahuyuk is referring to the Hartapu of Kizildar IV. Um, and he calls himself there, and he's referred to there as Kartapu. Whereas in the second line, it's Hartapu again. So I don't think you have, I also don't think you have two Hartapu sons of Mursili. There's Hartapu son of Mursili in Kizildar, in, uh, who's occurs in Turkman Karahuk. And, uh, Hartapu, son of Mursili, who occurs in Kizildar IV, they're the same person. Uh, 
So you, so you think the, the Kartapu and Hartapu of Turkmenkar Huyuk one are two different individuals who date 400 years apart and that's, this is a reused text? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we didn't mention it in this talk, but one of the, the real beauties of the Turkmenkar Huyuk one inscription is its actual nature as an inscription, which is uh, the fact that it uses two different writing uh, methods. And one is partially, partially in relief, partially uh, inscribed. And as Mark points out, the name of the individual is spelled differently the two times that it appears. And this is the kind of thing that we're not gonna resolve today. It's gonna be debated really forever until further evidence comes about. <laughs> I, I would just say, I have to agree with what Michele has said that although we can't categorically or empirically demonstrate what you've just said, Mark, is incorrect, it seems to be, to me, like what an old Turkish uh, language instructor uh, used to describe to me when students would come up with convoluted phrasings that just sort of like scratching your left ear with your right hand when you might as well just scratch it with your left hand. I think the easiest answer is simply that they're all the same individual just on logical grounds. But I also agree with Michele that I'm not, not a philologist and none of this panel is. Um, so the debates about exactly the paleographic dating and so on and the spellings of words, this will be for you to debate with, uh, with philologists. Absolutely. I'm just making an observation yeah, from my perspective. You. And if that means I'm scratching my ear with my ass, whatever, then that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a very helpful thing. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm just going to disable you if that's right. Um, I think this is a, a good trailer for hopefully a virtual seminar with, with Petra and Theo. Um, if we can, if we can get a get them, if it, get a slot in their busy schedules, I think in the next couple of months that'll be really good, and I think we can have this debate properly um, there. That'll be fantastic. Um, I think we are getting close to the time when we said we would have to ring off, and if there are any other final questions, please do get them in in the last two or three minutes. But um, in the meantime, oh, hang on, oh gosh, one has just come in. Oh, Chris Williams, could you be specific on the writing systems, um, Chris? that might be in, is that something you can address very quickly or maybe Chris, it might be easier for you to look at the, um, the article in Anatolian studies perhaps to, to get more detail um, on yeah. that. Um, but otherwise everyone, we've had lots of thank yous in the chat, uh, people who might've had to log off a little bit early, but thank you all very much uh, for this. Um, was there, no, that is the last one. And thing we, it has been extremely useful. It's built, I think, very much on last month's uh, seminar, um, which, which was given by James Osborne. And I, I do, I, it would have been nice if we'd had the inscription seminar immediately after, but the, the scheduling didn't quite work out in the same way. Um, I will leave any last words from the panel before we disappear. No, no, thank you. Thanks for no. coming, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting us. So thank you all very much for giving your time uh, to answer our questions. And I would like to remind everyone, if we are, um, Daniel has just posted this in the chat, we're having another lecture at the same time next week um, on uh, the 1920s and 2000s, rethinking the roles of Turkey's ulema. So if you're interested in that, please do sign up for that Zoom. Otherwise, the next one of our Anatolian Studies uh, virtual seminar series will be the same time next month. Uh, and we will be talking about landscape survey in Western Turkey in Ionia with Elif Koporal and Rick Faison. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined us, all of our attendees, and thank you very, very much to our panelists and especially Michaelo for the presentation. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good night.